out of anthropology, ethnology, geology, paleontology, archaeology, as well as history, I have dug up an irrefutable arsenal of facts that Harvard or Yale or cowardly scholarship in our race dare not refute. How can a leadership point the way forward that is utterly ignorant of the past? Mrs. Drusilla Dungy Houston The slave trade Mrs. Houston reminds us did really break the threads of remembrance of our people. We ought to listen to the marvelous way the story is unfurled by the pen of Drusilla of our ancestors who wrought mightily for mankind and built, surrounded by sand, the foundations of a civilization that weathered the storms of time, tide, and sun. Arthur A. Schomburg Mrs. Houston has done what few other Negro authors have had the necessary patience and perseverance to do. She has delved deep into the new past to show that the literature, art, music, religion, and customs of the Greeks and other early torchbearers of civilization were all permeated and influenced by the Ethiopians. Welcome to the Archive of Nations, whom are the custodians of the sacred records from time immemorial. Please subscribe and press the notification button as we have many lessons to educate and empower with a correct narrative of the past to create a lawful blueprint for the future. Welcome to episode 17 entitled Mrs. Drusilla Houston, the Wonderful Ethiopian of the Ancient Kushite Empire. In our research for the upcoming Carbon Organic Hebrews are the founders of Western civilization, we scoured the many books within the Archive of Nations Library and happened upon this gem of a book. In reading the introduction, we had to honor this woman for her great contributions to her global community and wider humanity. What really inspired us to do this work is the parallels of trying to educate her race on no budget, no assistance, usually no recognition, just a love and passion in doing what the universe has ordained for you to complete. In this, we and the many others homegrown scholars as content creators, teachers, authors, speakers, artists, activists, and pioneers who are dedicated to waking up their people simply out of love and passion. We felt this in reading the introduction to the book and felt it was our duty to remind the masses of this great woman, her accomplishments, and introduce you to her writings called The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire by Drusilla Houston, Book One Nations of the Kushite Empire and Their Marvelous Facts from Authentic Records by the Universal Publishing Company, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, USA 1926. Drusilla Dungy, Houston, 1876-1941, daughter of John William and Lydia Taylor Dungy, was a teacher, journalist, self-trained historian, and by any standard, a remarkable woman born at Winchester, Virginia in 1876. She lived most of her adult life in the Southwest, first in Oklahoma, and later Phoenix, Arizona. She had moved with her family to Oklahoma for Minnesota, where her father worked for the American Baptist Home Mission Society as an educator, fundraiser, and church-building missionary. John Dungy has been critically credited with instilling in the young Drusilla a sense of race pride. Visits to the family home by her father's close associates Frederick Douglass, Blanche Kay, Bruce, and other prominent blacks further enhanced the sense of race pride and left lasting impressions on the young writer-to-be. Significantly, it was in her father's expansive library that she first poured over what she would later refer to as the dry bones of history. At 22 years of age, Drusilla eloped and married Price Houston, a storekeeper, 11 years her senior. One child, a daughter, was born to this union. Drusilla settled with her husband in McAllister, Oklahoma. There she opened the McAllister Seminary, a school she operated for 12 years. In 1915, Miss Houston's younger brother Roscoe purchased a small printing plant from which he published one of the best edited weeklies in the Southwest, The Black Dispatch of Oklahoma City. Keeping The Black Dispatch alive during its early days was a difficult task. It exacted a tremendous price of devotion and commitment from the young editor, who had sold vegetables to earn the money to buy the printing plant. Seldom was there enough money to pay writers, assistant editors, or staff. Drusilla supported her brother's efforts during those early days and served as a contributing editor for the publication. Her columns were readily featured in the Black Dispatch. Those dealing with Negro history and black social concerns were frequently syndicated to black newspapers throughout the United States by the Associated Negro Press, consequently gaining for Drusilla recognition and a wide black readership. 
A conscientious student of African history, she was further inspired in our studies after reading W.E.B. Du Bois' The Negro First, published in 1915. The Negro was a landmark book, representing one of Du Bois' early attempts to refute the racist notion of Africans having no history before the coming of the European. Although limited by the size of the volume, Du Bois nevertheless attempted to outline African history from an African perspective. In addition, he set forth an early framework for viewing the unity of African people throughout the diaspora. Formerly aroused by Dr. Du Bois theme and his writing, Miss Houston committed herself to the task of writing a multi-volume history of the black race. Her laborious efforts were cultivated in 1926 with the publication of The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire, Volume 1, most often referred to as The, the Wonderful Ethiopians. Massive in its scope, the volume takes the reader on a journey beginning with the origin of civilization. It moves rapidly into ancient Egypt and Ethiopia. It then moves on to establish connecting linkages with the ancient black populations of Arabia, Persia, Babylonia, and India. In each case, she concluded that the ancient blacks that inhabited these regions were culturally linked and had been the progenitors of civilization in these areas. Significantly, most of the major black newspapers and journals of the day favorably reviewed the wonderful Ethiopians. This did not mean Mrs. Houston's self-trained approach to history was not criticized. Mary White Ovington, writer for the Chicago Defender, criticized the book for having no footnotes, no bibliography, and no index, but went on to compliment Mrs. Houston and presenting such a mess of facts that one cannot be impressed by the majestic majesty of the Kushite dynasties and a former greatness of black men. When J. Dada Rogers, the noted journalist and self-trained historian, reviewed the wonderful Ethiopians for a New York paper, the Amsterdam News, he criticizes Miss Houston's work for having at least one flaw. Too many laudatory objectives. Perhaps because his own work has received similar criticism. Rogers believed while Miss Houston's style of writing made the volumes more interesting to the average reader, it detracted from the volume scholarship. In spite of his criticism, Rogers, too, was impressed by the abundance of sources used by Miss Houston used to support her conclusions. All of which shows a tremendous amount of research on the part of Miss Houston and some of which this reviewer, Rogers, must admit is new to him. Rogers went on to recommend that the wonderful Ethiopians be placed in every Negro home and school in the land. Arthur A. Schomburg, a dedicated race man, bibliophile, and historian, wrote perhaps the most favorable review of the work. Schomburg welcomed the appearance of Miss Houston's work, and in a column syndicated to several black newspapers, Schomburg showered the book with praise. I can assure everyone that the author must have used considerable oil in her lamp, represented by her exhaustive research, the indefatigable labor that resulted in the astonishing compilation before me. We are indebted to Drusilla D. Houston for this illuminating and comprehensive book. The wonderful Ethiopians also received endorsement from other influential blacks and whites. Robert L. Van of the Pittsburgh Courier wrote, We know of no book published in the last 25 years which offers such reputable inspiration to the black people of the earth. Cornelius Edwin Walker, a white author, wrote, You prove your contention from the first that civilization came from the black race. Dr. I. W. Young, president of Langston University, predicted a bright future for Miss Houston's writings. By far, she is the most interesting writer among us. Equipped with splendid education and home training, her writings will permanently affect race conditions in this country. From all evidence collected, it appears that volumes two and three of Miss Houston's epic saga were completed but never published. The evidence also seems to suggest that these volumes may have been subject to various revisions, updating and title changes as they awaited publication. In a letter written to Schomburg in 1927, she discussed the wonderful Ethiopians and its companion volumes. The book you read was only one of three that is completed. I do not know when the other two can be. Number two is Ancient Kushites in Western Europe. And there is a book three, that I think is the more beautiful of the free. Miss Houston also referred to the two volumes at varying times in a syndicated column. In her column of September 15, 1934, which was published by the Louisiana Weekly and other papers under the heading Wondrous History of the Negro, she described for two volumes. 
One is the origin of the Aryans. This book will be valuable because it reveals the root of the strange and undying race hatred of Western Europe. But the other wonderful Ethiopians of the Americas is a book on which I had been at work for 25 years. The NAACP's William Pickens, a close friend of Drusilla's brother Roscoe, provides further proof of the existence of the two volumes. In a profile of Miss Houston and our work, he described the two volumes as portraying the black race's remarkable evolution from the origin of civilization to the dawn of a new world. He went on to indicate that economic barriers had prevented Mrs. Houston from publishing the remaining volumes. While it certainly appears that lack of finances was an important factor, preventing publication of the second and third volumes, Mrs. Houston's failing health was also a major deterrent. The last days of her life was spent in a relative seclusion in Phoenix, Arizona. There she waged a losing battle against tuberculosis and passed out of this existence February 2, 1941. At the time, she was working on yet another volume of Negro History. The uniqueness of Drusilla D. Houston's achievements is striking. To appreciate them fully, we must keep in mind that she was at a terrible disadvantage when she conducted her research and wrote the wonderful Ethiopians and its companion volumes. Lacking adequate financial resources, she was forced to work without the benefit of a staff or assisting researchers. Most of our research was conducted in Oklahoma, far away from major libraries and universities. As she became more involved with her research, her circle of associates narrowed. Her preoccupation with a task few members of her community understood or fully appreciated earned her the label of being unsociable and uppity. In spite of these handicaps, she became a self-taught encyclopedia of facts and data about people of African descent. Her mastery of facts enabled her to become a member of an elite loosely affiliated grouping of black self-trained historians who use history as a positive weapon of propaganda. These historians practiced an art that was effectively used to correct the distorted and negative manner in which most white historians portrayed blacks. At the same time, they used their art to suit the psyche of the black masses by repeatedly insisting that not only you are somebodies, you are great somebodies. Using newspapers, books, and pamphlets, often self-published, these historians prevailed against the odds, keeping a sense of true black history alive amongst the black masses. They nursed and cuddled black history until strong enough, it became one of the driving forces of the black liberation movement during the 1960s and 1970s. It is just as important to note that Mrs. Houston broke new ground when she published The Wonderful Ethiopians and established herself as an expert on the history of ancient Africa, its people, and the world. She boldly entered into a domain that was ruled largely by white male historians. To accomplish this feat, she was forced to overcome sociocultural biases of race and sex, which characterized the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Women and blacks of this era were increasingly victimized by pseudo-scientific studies in eugenics and craniology. These studies often provided a scientific rationale for the continued oppression of blacks and women. Both groups were said to possess distinctly smaller brains than their white male counterparts. Unfortunately, this deficiency limited the abilities of blacks and women to become intense abstract thinkers. A pioneer in what today is known as the Black Studies Movement, she documented history from a pan-African perspective. As did Dubois, she recognized for cultural and blood ties, which connects African people the world over. In this sense, she precedes, anticipates, and shares in the views articulated by contemporary pan-African-minded scholars such as Chancellor Williams, Sheik Anta Diop, Yosef Ben Jochanan, John Henry Clark, and others. Invigorated by her research and her findings, she proclaimed an African origin of civilization in 1926, a year when one black American was lynched in the United States every 23 days. Brutal evidence of the nation's attempt to reinforce the concept of black inferiority. It was this false concept that Drusilla Houston's wonderful Ethiopians attacked. Mrs. Houston was not the first African-American woman to establish herself as a chronicler of black history but she's the earliest known to use her knowledge and abstract thinking to offer a multi-volume study of ancient Africa and its descendants. In doing this, she not only made a significant contribution to black women's history, she also expanded the foundation of black historiography. 
In a resolute manner, she refused to see accomplishments as individual victories, preferring to see them as contributions in the struggle for race, pride, and dignity. In every sense of the word, she was a race woman who believed her work was God-inspired and that it would ultimately help eradicate ignorance that she held to be one of the most principal causes of race prejudice. Regrettably, the work, as well as its author, has been relegated to obscurity. The wonderful Ethiopians is seldom, if ever, discussed when scholars examine the foundation of black historiography. Moreover, Drusilla Houston's name is rarely included among those black women writers of the 1920s and 1930s, leading one to conclude that black women writers of this period limited themselves to fiction, poetry, and other forms of writing, but not history and certainly not African history. Drusilla Dungy Houston and her efforts have all been forgotten. We owe a great debt to this black woman, a debt William Pickens recognized when he wrote, if her race were culturally ready and economically able to buy her books, what an historic foundation she could lay for them. The patience with which she has dug into the past history of races, and especially her own, is genius. If there was no race prejudice in America, she would have wealth and much greater fame when she has. Perhaps someday we will build her a statue or name a university after when we have finished starving to death and buried her. Black Classic Press is pleased to reintroduce Mrs. Houston and wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient Kushite Empire to the public. An index prepared by Mrs. Julia W. Bond of Atlanta, Georgia creatively includes a bibliographic listing of sources cited by Mrs. Houston. Commentary by James Spady and the afterword by Asa G., Hilliard do much to place Mrs. Houston and her work within a more comprehensive perspective. W. Paul Coates, January 24, 1985 Here is the preface from the author. The minds of men today are stirred with eager questionings about the origin of civilization and about the part the different races of mankind played in its development from primitive ages. The remains that archaeologists are uncovering in Egypt, Old Babylonia, and South America reveal that there were significant factors in the first development of the arts and sciences that history has failed to make clear. Scientists are busy today studying the types of those old civilizations and comparing them with those of the present. Our modern systems do not function for the masses to give them development and happiness as did some of the ancient cultures. Books upon the early life of man are very hard to secure. Few have been written that are authentic because it requires technical skill to assemble and condense such matter. Exhaustive research work is necessary to secure this kind of information, with only a line here and there in modern books to help the reader to reach definite conclusions. Only the trained mind holds the multitude of details and possesses the ability to impartially weigh and classify the facts that prove the influence of the races upon the civilization of today. The quest for the innumerable and startling facts of the succeeding volumes arose, much as did the motive of Schliemann to seek the buried ruins of Troy from the oft-repeated expression found by the author in research work that what the ancients said about the Ethiopians was fabulous. Curiosity was aroused to go back over the story of the ancients to agree or draw new conclusions. The finds were so astonishing that the vow was made to spend upon this study many years if necessary. Like the quest of the Holy Grail, the aim became sacred, for the trail led backward into the heart of all that the world holds most precious and to the primal roots from which all culture sprang. At first, the reading of an afternoon in the average public library would hardly reveal a line to the credit of the Ethiopian. Sometimes a ten-volume set of modern books might yield only a few paragraphs, but the vow and the richness of the finds, gleaming like diamonds, led the eager searcher on. The trail was followed into the dry, dusty books of the ancients, where the path widened and truth was revealed that will answer some of the baffling problems of civilization today. Here were missing links of the chain of culture vainly sought for elsewhere. Our story will deal with the ancient Kushite Empire of Ethiopians that covered three continents and held unbroken sway for 3,000 years. We will visit old Ethiopia, where, as Herodotus said, the gods delighted to banquet with the pious inhabitants. We will study the land and the ancient race. The old race will next win our attention that Petrie found in Egypt of distinct and unique culture, who were the people of the earlier and superior civilization of the first dynasties. 
Down through this prehistoric vista we see Happy Arabia with her brilliant primitive culture and her unrivaled literature of later days. On the screen flashes the rich and surpassing culture of old Chaldea, which belonged to the ancient Kushite empire of Ethiopians. Next comes veiled and mysterious India, the scene of charming story and magic fable, with her subtle mysticism and philosophy. Tarrying a while with the conquest and life of the ancient Medes and Persians, the trail runs far afield into the dominions of Western Europe and the striking questions array themselves demanding to be answered. Who were the Celts? Who were the Teutons? And what was the origin of the so-called Aryan race? The author was as much astounded, as will be the reader, as to what this study reveals. It leaves us wondering if there is any Aryan race. We learn in the study of the races of Western Europe to understand the hatreds of Europe that underlaid the World War. We learn that when the Celt and Teuton call the Ethiopians of the New World uncle and auntie, they are using titles that are scientifically true. Our story passes on to another remnant of the ancient Kushite Empire, that baffling race, the Iberians, now represented by the Basques, then to the Berbers of North Africa, another branch of the Kushite race. Some scientists have called them the descendants of the people of Atlantis. Next succeed the singular facts about the life of the mysterious Etruscans of old Italy who were the teachers of the Romans. Then we follow the life and tragedy of the fleeting Pelasgians who were the fountain out of which later Greek culture welled. They were the people of the legends of Greek mythology. It is almost impossible to find anything but scanty fragments in the world's literature about any of these people of prehistoric days, but our text has compiled these fragments, so many of them, as to form fascinating chapters. Today, all of these subjects remain unexplained mysteries in the average book. We dwell for a while on the marvels of the lost civilization of the Aegean and stop to study the Greece of Homer and the meaning of the Greek legends, all having direct relation to the ancient Kushites. Historic Greece in all her glory, but viewed from new angles, passes before us with the older and superior civilization of Asia Minor, which has been almost entirely overlooked in modern literature. Next we come to the fact that the Phoenicians called themselves Ethiopians and that the Hebrew writers gave them the same name. Then we reflect upon the strange relationship of the family of Kushite tongues to the so-called Indo-European group of languages. The trail leads us high up to where we get a breathless view of the astounding Ethiopian religion, which gives us the answer to many strange and incomprehensible traits in the Ethiopian of today. Next follows the chapter on the wonderful Ethiopians, who produced fadeless colors that have held their hues for thousands of years, who drilled through solid rock and were masters of many other lost arts and who many scientists believed must have understood electricity, who made metal figures that could move and speak and may have invented flying machines. For the flying horse Pegasus and the ram of the golden fleece may not have been mere fairy tales. Next out of the forgotten wastes of the dark continent rise before us ancient African empires, representing other civilizations of the time of the Cretan age. Then across the screen comes flashing the ancient Kushite trade routes, which contrary to our notion were the medium by which rich and varied products were interchanged. In the chapter on ancient Kushite commerce, we follow the ships of these early, daring, and skillful seamen who before the dawn of history had blazed out the ocean trails that the Phoenicians later followed. We find irrefutable evidence of the presence of these daring conquerors in the primitive legends, religion, and institutions of America. Next out of the dim haze of far antiquity rise the indistinct lines of Atlantis of old, the race that gave civilization to the world, the race that tamed the animals and gave us domestication of plants. The gods of the ancient world were the kings and queens of mystic Atlantis. The chapter The Gods of Old makes plain that the deities of Greece and Rome were also the kings and queens of the ancient Kushite empire of the Ethiopians, which was either the successor of the most famous branch of the Atlantic race. It was about these princes and heroes that all the wonderful mythology of the ancients was woven. They were the deities that were worshipped in India, Chaldea, Egypt, and in Greece and Rome, which nations themselves must have been related to the race of Atlantis that tradition said had been overwhelmed by the sea. Atlantis could not have been mythical, for her rulers were the subjects of the art and literature of all the primitive nations until the fall of paganism long after the birth of Christ. Another division of Atlantis was Transatlantic America. There the mysterious mound builders represent the ancient Kushite race. 
We study the peculiar culture and genius of the fierce Aztec, who acknowledged that he received the germs of civilization from the earlier Kushite inhabitants. We pass southward and examine the higher development of the wonderful Mayas of North America, whose ruins are attracting special study today, and we find they transplanted the Kushite arts of the ancient world. Next flash the pictures of the marvelous culture and arts of the Incas, superior to those of Western Europe in 1492. From America the story turns to the Bronze and Iron Ages, we seek the origin of the mysterious bronze implements of Western Europe found in the hands of seemingly barbarous people. We seek for the place and the race that could have given the world the art of welding iron. The trail reveals that the land of the Golden Fleece and the Garden of the Golden Apples of Hesperides were but centers of the ancient race that as Kushite Ethiopians had extended themselves over the world. These are subjects that have attracted the study of world scholarship. They represent not mere myths, but are all that vast ages have left to us of events of primitive race history. Kushite art and the heart of the African answer many questionings of our hearts about Ethiopians. The series closes with a comparison of ancient culture with modern forms. The intelligence of the Kushite, his original genius, is held up beside the decadence of true ideals in the art and literature of the present. The revolt of civilization and dawn of a new world voice the concern of the thoughtful over the present decay of culture. We are sending forth this information because so few men today understand the primitive forces that are the root of modern culture. So superficial and prejudiced has been most modern research that many important and accepted theories of universal history have no actual basis in fact. The average modern historical book contradicts what the ancients said about the nations. That preceded them. We cannot solve the stupendous problems that the world faces until we can read or write the riddle of the evolution of the races. Uninformed men make unsafe leaders. That is the primal cause for so many errors of judgment in state and national councils. We look upon them not as statesmen, but as promoters of petty politics, for out of their deliberations spring no alleviation of the woes of the world. It is from this lack of understanding and leadership that the world suffers most today. We could discriminate between the true and false in our civilization if we knew more about primitive culture. The way by which the first man climbed must ever be the human way. Racial prejudices are the greatest menace to world progress. Classes clash because the wealth of the world concentrates more and more in the hands of a few. The tragedy of human misery increases, the increase of defectives, the growing artificiality of modern living, compels us to seek and blazon forth the knowledge of the true origin of culture and the fundamental principles that through the ages have been the basis of true progress. Only by this wisdom shall we know how to lift human life today. In most modern books there seems to be preconcerted understanding to calumniate and disgust the world with abominable pictures of the ruined Ethiopian, ruined by the African slave trade of 400 years. There seems to be a worldwide conspiracy in literature to conceal the facts that this book unfolds. Because of this suppression of truth, world crimes have been easily made possible against the Ethiopian. These people are held in low estimation because truth is hidden which proves that today the more favored races are at the apex of human accomplishment, yet in the earlier ages the wheel of destiny carried upward those who now seem hopelessly under. To wipe away the black stain of the slave trade, modern literature has represented the slave trader as having trafficked in depraved human beings. Today the lower types of the Aryan race look upon them as creatures only fit for political and economic spoilation to fill the coffers of the colonial renegade who could not succeed at home. This type of the world finds it easy to stifle the life of ruined and defenseless races. This spoilation of the weak returned in a counterstroke from which it was impossible to escape in the world war. Belgium reaped an identical measure and kind what this type had meted out to the defenseless people of the Congo. Nations must reap what they sow. This is not the nature or intention of the better men of the civilized nations, but we are uninformed about alien peoples. We are narrow and provincial in our views. The hatred of the races springs out of misunderstanding. The men of the world who have traveled and read and thought upon ethnological problems are the men who have the cultivated instincts of human brotherhood. 
Shall England, France, Germany, America suffer further because we have not taught the uninformed of the nations that we must pay a still heavier toll for a continued measure of injustice to weaker peoples? Innocent must suffer with the guilty, for it is in our power to inform and curb the power of the selfish. The question looms large in the minds of thinking men today, whether Ethiopians are worthy of equal opportunity. Let us settle forever out of time's irrefutable evidence, whether if we gave him the chance, the Ethiopian would treat us as we have treated him. There need be no conjecturing, for the archives of the past hold the facts. The history of the Kushite Ethiopians down through the ages is one of the most thrilling as well as tragic of all time's age-old stories. It is almost incredible that its rich treasure for developing our understanding has so long remained veiled. The Ethiopian is a great race, probably the oldest. It is a race that does not die out under adversity. When other races are sullen or despairing and turn to self-destruction, these people cheerfully press on. When they think the way is blocked, they turn aside to pick flowers along the pathway of pleasure. We hear their happy voices in the cotton field, they can be the life of the carnival, their zealous fervor in camp meeting and the swing song of the marching black regiments of the World War and the stevedore regiments in peace, show these people as they employ themselves, patiently waiting for bars to progress to rot down, if nothing else will remove them. Then again they take up the steady march onward, that has been the wonderful element of their history on down through the ages. We need our eyes opened, this type that we in ignorance despise, built the eternal pyramids of Egypt and laid the foundation of the civilization of the historic ages, because the slave trade broke the threads of remembrance, they walk among us with bowed heads, themselves ignorant of the facts that this story unfolds. Lift up your heads, discouraged and downtrodden Ethiopians. Listen to this marvelous story told of your ancestors who wrought mightily for mankind and built the foundations of civilization true and square in the days of old. Awake ye sleeping Aryans, become aware of the acute need of the world today of this enchained energy and ability. The absence of this power is the cause of many a breakdown in modern civilization. Out of our own accepted sciences, the chapters of this book prove the Kushite race to have been the fountainhead of civilization. If you desire truth, if you desire to be fair-minded, to be educated in vital knowledge not possessed by the average college student, if you desire to be an authority upon the life of the ancients, go down with me as archaeology, ethnology, geology, and philology disclose, not in a dry and tedious way, but through the unfolding of this the most intensely interesting and startling drama of the ages. The Kushite race, its institutions, Customs, laws, and ideals were the foundation upon which our modern culture was laid. Let this not stir the pride of the modern Kushite, but rather inspire him to a greater consecration to the high idealism that made the masteries of olden days. Knowledge of the primal strength and weaknesses of each world group must be possessed by world leadership or we shall still further go astray. Without this knowledge international councils cannot intelligently assign each race to its rightful place in the consummation of God's plan of the ages. Without this truth the nations cannot put over their programs. The world war proved that we have no international stability. The world's securities and diplomatic relations are propped. Because the real history of mankind is not a part of our general knowledge, we are discounting factors most needed to secure world balance. There can be no more needed contribution to civilization than to gather from the archives of the past and present-day science all the truth about the origin of culture. Only thus will we know how to develop better men today. If we knew just what contribution each race has made to art, science, and religion, we would know what would be its fitness to take part in world government and control. Hag the influence of a race been creative or destructive throughout the ages? That should point plainly to the part they would be likely to play today. Because we are without this knowledge, we cannot read or write the past or present history of civilization. Modern crimes of injustice toward weaker peoples have been made easy by this suppression of truth. It has been popular and remunerative to write and speak on the side of prejudice. A better spirit is rising in the world. Men are eager for information, for the truth. Through the teaching of sociology, the most popular and crowded classes of our great universities, in a scientific way, man is beginning to see the need of a realization of our common brotherhood and to reach out to solve unmastered problems and unfulfilled duties. 
Many problems are in international consternation because they are too gigantic for the handling of any one world group. Civilization was appalled at its helplessness in the world war. The leading nations faced annihilation, yet were unable to walk out of the trap until the flower of European manhood had perished. The noblest offered themselves for sacrifice, the more selfish remained at home. The world may never be capable of calculating its artistic and moral loss. We see the difference in the crime and debauchery breaking down the culture of today. Unless we can rouse men to truth and united effort, there is no hope for our civilization which is tottering and must fall. In justice to that divine leading that piloted this search of a decade over trails that otherwise might not have been found in a lifetime, in tribute to the pluck and consecration to a purpose, to add to the light of truth, that has gathered such an avalanche of testimony from authoritative sources, we speak of this work which has taken all those spare moments that are our right to spend in leisure, that a frail, unflagging spirit might make possible this marvelous story, as strange as any. Old and fairy tale, yet by the light of our accepted science is true. We lift the veil lightly lest the careless skim over these pages carelessly, little wrecking what they have cost. Often when limbs and weary brain cried out in protest, the searcher pressed on, seeing fully the power in this truth if patiently, carefully gathered, to lift the men of all races to a clearer comprehension of the contribution of each race to all that we prize in civilization, and to stir within us the determination to lift and bear aloft the torch lit in primitive ages by a race today despised and misunderstood. The average book has its dozen helpers and advisors. This work has been done in hermitage. The hermitage of a life submerged in service. Humbly, reverently, this truth is offered in love to all races. Ten years more may be devoted to its final setting, but the facts embedded in these pages are too important to be longer withheld. The author. Drusilla Dungy Houston.